I am delighted now to uh, invite Ambassador Jan Kickert to uh, explain why we need a nuclear ban treaty. I should explain to you that uh, we already had a very uh, spirited uh, first pass at this. Uh, the case for a nuclear uh, ban treaty was made by Beatrice Finn, uh, the executive director of uh, ICANN. And uh, we now uh, invite you. I, I, I have to say that I have enormous confidence that if this is to come to pass, it'll be because of the dynamism of Ambassador Jan Kickert and passion. Thank you very much. Well, I think it's a little bit too much. Uh, and Austria is not uh, alone in this endeavor. Um, we rely very strongly in what we think uh, is the right thing to do on civil society, inter alia ICANN, and also um, uh, on a group of uh, countries which are together with Austria in, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in a group which drives it uh, forward, uh, which is cross-regional. So if I speak here, it is, uh, I think I, I represent uh, more than only Austria, but yes, we, Austria, we are passionate uh, in what we're doing and trying to drive forward uh, nuclear disarmament. And uh, I apologize for being late. Uh, the reason is that uh, in parallel, the General Assembly, we had the election of uh, the president of the next General Assembly, and I so happened to be also the chair of, of the WEOC group, the Western European other groups this month, so I had to be there. And I probably have to go a little later also over because there might be some uh, contested elections uh, to make things a little spicier and easier. And one of the issues, I think, which also is, is, is not, uh, unfortunately, not uncontested, is uh, our endeavor to uh, work out and to negotiate a legally binding instrument uh, to prohibit nuclear weapons. We don't use the, the, the term ban treaty. Uh, um, we, we stick to the terms we have agreed upon here in the uh, UNGA. And within the next two weeks, a conference uh, will start here. Um, there is already a draft uh, um, uh, for such a convention on the table, tabled by the, the head, uh, um, uh, the president of, uh, of this process. And you might ask, why do we need such an agreement? And uh, I, let me try to, to take you a bit back to see what brought us here. Um, we all know the consequences of nuclear explosions. We all have seen the pictures of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. We have heard the survivors, the Hibakusha. And yet, these weapons, many times more powerful today than back then, are still around, ready to be, to be deployed at any time, capable of destroying cities, devastating countries, killing millions instantly, and much, many more over time, even wiping out life on Earth altogether. Faced with the horrific destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the United Nations General Assembly, by its very first resolution, established a commission to ensure, and I quote, the elimination from national armaments of atomic weapons and all other major weapons adaptable to mass destruction. Whereas we have made remarkable progress concerning chemical and biological weapons, Sadly enough, for nuclear weapons, this goal remained but a wish. Worse, the following 70 years brought about the opposite. More countries acquired nuclear weapons, enormous arsenals were built up, and the so-called mutually assured destruction, or abbreviated MAD paradigm, was established. Some hope flared up through the grand bargain struck in 1970, in the form of the NPT, the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. Whereas the bulk of the parties committed themselves not to develop nuclear weapons while having access to peaceful use of nuclear energy, the five nuclear weapon states in exchange committed to carrying out good faith negotiations with the aim to completely disarm the nuclear arsenals, 1970. Sadly, 47 years later, the aim has not materialized. Not only is nuclear disarmament at a standstill and have nuclear disarmament negotiations ground to a halt, on top of that, extensive and expensive modernization programs not only aim to ensure the existence of nuclear weapon systems for decades to come, but modernizations actually are nothing else but rearmament. 
maybe not in the quantitative, but in certainly in the qualitative sense. And this disturbing and unsatisfactory state of affairs has been fundamentally challenged by the knowledge gained through and the conclusions drawn from the so-called humanitarian initiative. This initiative stemmed from a speech delivered in 2010 by Jakob Kellenberger, the then president of the International Committee of the Red Cross. He recalled the ICRC's experience as the first international humanitarian organization present in the immediate aftermath of the 1945 bombing in Hiroshima. He highlighted the inadequate capacities to address the humanitarian emergencies that would result from any use of nuclear weapons and the human and societal destruction that would ensue. He further stated, the ICRC finds it difficult to envisage how any use of nuclear weapons could be compatible with the rules of international humanitarian law. Based on this, and the preamble of paragraph one of the MPT, which states, I quote, considering the devastation that would be visited upon all mankind by a nuclear war, and the consequent need to make every effort to avert the danger of such a war and to take measures to safeguard the security of peoples, the 2010 MPT review conference for the first time clearly addressed the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons in its consensus outcome document. This was taken up by Norway at the time, they're no longer part of the core group unfortunately, Mexico and Austria, who in three conferences in 2013 and 2014, through an in-depth scientific exchange established that the immediate, medium-term, and long-term impact of a nuclear weapon explosion would be significantly graver than was understood in the past. It would not be constrained by national borders, but would have regional or even global effects, potentially threatening the survival of humanity. Experts examined and discussed the risks and dangers of nuclear weapons based on the latest available information. For most of us who attended these conference, it was really a sobering wake-up call about the real risk involved with nuclear weapons today. We learned that the potential geographical scope of contaminated territory after detonation was much larger than previously expected. We learned that there is simply no capacity, neither among any state nor at the international level as a whole, to respond in a remotely adequate matter, manner to the consequences of nuclear explosions. We learned that a nuclear war could lead to a nuclear winter potentially wiping out life on Earth altogether. We learned about the countless times there had almost been a nuclear incident due to com computer errors, human blunders, mistakes, or accidents in, in storage facilities, all the way to an inadvertent nuclear war. We were just incredibly lucky so far. We learned from mathematicians who calculate risk that due to the gravity of the consequences of a nuclear war, it is statistically more likely that our children will die from the consequences of a nuclear explosion than from a car crash. In sum, we learned that we were hugely underestimating the risks associated with nuclear weapons not even the deployment, just having them. And it underlines a stunning clarity that nuclear weapons carry a risk that is in no way commensurate with their purported advantages. We thus came away from this conference with the conviction that we must reduce that risk and that the only way to reduce it was the prohibition of such weapons through a legally binding instrument. The longer nuclear weapons exist, the higher the likelihood of nuclear explosions of any kind or magnitude. And even a residual risk of a nuclear explosion is simply unacceptable in view of the devastating humanitarian impact it would have. These concerns of ours found their reflection first in the so-called humanitarian pledge, which we launched during the humanitarian conference in Vienna. It was endorsed so far by 127 countries. The humanitarian pledge was also welcomed by two United Nations General Assembly resolutions in 2015 and in 2016. Furthermore, the concerns were reflected in the so-called humanitarian statement delivered by my foreign minister uh, on behalf of 159 states in the NPT Review Conference 2015, which underlined that, and I quote, it is in the interest of the very survival of humanity 
that nuclear weapons are never used again under any circumstances. The catastrophic effects of a nuclear weapon detonation, whether by accident, miscalculation, or design, cannot be adequately addressed. All efforts must be exerted to eliminate the threat of these weapons of mass destruction. Consequently, UN member states decided to set up an open-ended working group to determine the best way to address the existing legal gap regarding nuclear weapons, and in the group's report concluded that, just like for biological and chemical weapons, a prohibition would be needed. The mandate to negotiate such a pro prohibition was adopted by a two-thirds majority of states president voting in last year's General Assembly. A so-called zero draft of a prohibition treaty was presented by the chairwoman of the conference last week, and by early July, we hope that the involved parties will conclude such a treaty. Not all states uh, have decided to participate. Among them, most states possessing nuclear weapons, countries under so-called nuclear umbrella, or countries bound in formal or informal alliances with nuclear weapon states. Let me try to address some of the arguments we heard from them against the prohibition of nuclear weapons. First, some say nuclear weapons are here to stay. It is impossible to invent nu nuclear weapons. Well, neither could we de-invent biological or chemical weapons, and yet we prohibited them. De-inventing nuclear weapons is thus not necessary. Prohibition suffices. From other weapons prohibition treaties, we know that we can set up effective treaty regimes. We also aren't starting from scratch and can build on existing mechanisms. The IAA has already gained profound experience. We have the NPT system and recently also the JCPOA with Iran. And we are not naive. We know the prohibition treaty is just one element, a necessary first step that will lay the foundation for further instruments be complemented by a comprehensive set of additional sequenced measures to achieve the total elimination of nuclear weapons. We know this may take some time, but that should not deter us. Doing nothing is, is just passively waiting for the grand catastrophe to happen. We should take the first step by laying out the goal of the process, the legal prohibition of nuclear weapons. Second argument is that the prohibition of nuclear weapons could reduce security. I might just ask, who's security? But let me be clear, nobody here wants to make any state less secure or any person less safe, whether they come from a nuclear weapon state or a non-nuclear weapon state. Indeed, every state, including every nuclear weapon state and every umbrella state, would be more secure and their people would be safer if no state had nuclear weapons. The treaty will increase security for all by removing the threat of ever having to face the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons. It is very clear our final goal of a world without nuclear weapons can only be achieved if nuclear weapon states participate. Only they can disarm. We, the non-nuclear weapon states, can't. And nuclear weapon states will only do so if they feel they will gain more security. So we must demonstrate that it is possible to gain more security by joining this initiative. What we seek is a general legal prohibition, establish the legal norm, and once we have that, then we can establish, together with the nuclear weapon states, a system of eliminating nuclear weapons altogether. But we have to start somewhere. One more point in this context. The argument that nuclear weapons are indispensable for security runs not only counter to the spirit and commitments of the NPT context, but is also self-defeating. If nuclear weapons are truly indispensable in providing security, as nuclear weapon states claim, then why should not all states benefit from this advantage? If we follow the argument that nuclear weapons make the world safer, would that not uh, imply that more weapons for more states would be better? Isn't that argument that even an open invitation to other states to acquire nuclear weapons if they seek security. I say, say, they say that in the context of the DPRK. So we don't believe in this argument, the security argument. Uh, clearly, we will only be safer with less nuclear weapons and ultimately with no nuclear weapons whatsoever. Only that will bring security for everyone and not only to, as some purport, um, nuclear weapon states. The third concern is the relationship of the Prohibition Treaty to the NPT. In the review conference of 2015, 
we have witnessed once again a humiliating failure of the NPT regime. Still, the NPT remains the indispensable cornerstone for us of the international nuclear non-proliferation disarmament regime, the best system of nuclear security we have so far. So we must protect and strengthen the NPT. That's what our prohibition treaty will do. It will not only be fully compatible with the NPT, it will build on Article 6, nuclear disarmament, and contribute to the implementation of the NPT, not only selectively, but in, in its entirety. Let's not forget, the possession of nuclear weapons under the NPT is not an eternal right. Indeed, the nuclear weapon states have committed themselves to complete nuclear disarmament. As the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, or hopefully in the near future, a fissile material cutoff treaty, also our prohibition treaty would be complementary and supportive of the NPT. It will not weaken the NPT, but will strengthen it. Finally, we often hear that this is not the right time for such an initiative, for such a treaty. Well, we have been waiting for any kind of progress on nuclear disarmament for decades. For the last 20 years, the Conference on Disarmament has not been even able to agree on a work program, let alone talk about content. The NPT since 1970, and again the action plan agreed that the NPT review conference in 2010 uh, by all uh, NPT states, including the nuclear weapon states, they agreed to include the commitment for nuclear disarmament with no serious results to speak of. Whenever we asked, we were told that the time was not right for nuclear disarmament. Either times were good, then there was no need for that. Then times were difficult with elections or the financial crisis or geopolitical tensions. Frankly, it never seems to be the right time. When more than two-thirds of the world's states support the prohibition treaty approach, I think it is an indication that the bulk of the NPT parties' patience for these excuses is simply running out. We also hear the argument that a so-called step-by-step approach is needed for nuclear weapons. Reductions, however incremental, uh, should be coming first to build trust, and then, uh, then afterwards maybe a pro prohibition treaty. Well, the experience from bi biological and chemical weapons proves, however, that weapons of mass destruction can be eliminated by having a legal prohibition first followed after by concrete elimination measures. Also, both the biological and the chemical weapons treaties were not universal in membership at their inception either. If we look at history, we see that nuclear disarmament occurred during the Cold War as well as during post-war peace. There was nuclear disarmament simply when there was political leadership to, determine, to be determined to achieve progress. Today's international security environment may be challenging, but wasn't it also the height of the Cold War when the leaders of the US and the USSR engaged in bilateral nuclear disarmament talks? Let us also not forget that what we seek is strictly speaking not a disarmament treaty. This is a process to prohibit a type of weapon that carries enormous risks and when detonated can cause enormous and horrendous human suffering. There is no wrong time to try to eliminate this type of weapon. And quite frankly, if we look at the risks, what is the alternative? Is doing nothing and simply sleepwalking into a nuclear disaster a better strategy? There's a right time to begin the process of prohibiting nuclear weapons, and we believe the time is now. In concluding a nuclear weapons prohibition treaty, we may be giving a necessary push to vital nuclear disarmament by starting to delegitimize and stigmatize this morally reprehensible weapon of mass destruction. In this respect, we may soon be witnessing one of those rare opportunities where we could make a bit of history. Let's hope for it, for our own survival, but much more so to secure a future for our children and grandchildren and humanity as such. Thank you.